Okay, um, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have another uh, very interesting program. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I wanna let you know what we have coming up this weekend though. It's our Arts Alive concert for November and uh, it's on Sunday uh, at 2 p.m. That's November 21st. And we have Tom Maloof who will be performing a show he calls Stuck in the 60s for Life. So they we're going to have some great 60s music. So whether you're from that time period and just want to go back down memory lane and enjoy it, or you just like the music from that era, please join us. Um, it's at two o'clock Sunday and you can sign up for it online, just like you did for tonight's program. Um, also, we have coming up on November 30th, uh, a winter watercolor workshop. Audrey Coe, who gave another workshop before and is just great, um, will be demonstrating how to paint a, uh, a winter uh, themed watercolor. Um, and if you would like to participate, there's a list of the supplies you will need online where you would go to register. Um, and if you don't want to participate, maybe you just want to watch and see if you'd have an interest in maybe uh, getting into something like that, sorry, um, then, then you can still come to the class. You don't have to get the supplies and actually do it, but just come to the class. She's very good. Like I said, she did another one and it was, it was great. Um, tonight we have with us uh, Jenny Warner and she's going to talk about the Mayflower Voyage, which uh, was a little over 400 years ago. I think it was 400 years ago last year. Um, but she's going to talk about the voyage and the people that um, the passengers that were on that ship. And she's also going to give us some tips on how to trace genealogy, our genealogy, uh, back in Mayflower, if, if we have that lineage. So hopefully we do, and, but, but Jenny will, will help us figure that out. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in chat and uh, she will be glad to answer them after uh, she speaks. So please welcome Jenny Warner. Thank you, Janet. I'm very, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, just to give people a, a little bit more information on myself before we get started. Um, I've been doing genealogy for over 40 years. Um, my mother started me very early in my life doing research and research in the family history, and I've just continued from that point forward. Um, I belong to 14 lineage societies, which are hereditary societies like the DAR, um, the, some of the Civil War groups. Uh, and I'm also president of the DuPage County Genealogical Society, and I'm a member of several of the genealogical societies in the area and then uh, out, out, out of state as well. So just to give you a little background on myself, I've also been professionally speaking now, this is my third year doing it full-time, not doing it part-time. So I'm enjoying speaking, I'm enjoying going through things with people and everything. So I'm hoping you enjoy the presentation. I've done this presentation lots of times. So, and this happens to be one of my favorite topics to talk about, so I hope everybody enjoys it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Voyage was actually last year in September. So um, this is based on um, last September, but a lot of this, a lot of the celebration even kept going a little bit after the September official anniversary, but a lot of things were delayed because of the COVID restrictions on the East Coast. Okay, I always put this disclaimer, a disclaimer on all my presentations that the websites or the web addresses I have do change and they can change daily. So if a link that I gave you in the handout doesn't work, it did work when the handout was created and I did check it before I sent a copy to the library to send out to everybody for this presentation. And then the images are, are courtesy of Family Search, the Society of Mayflower Descendants, 
mayflowerhistory.com just so you know where some of the images are actually coming from. And then some are also coming from Wikipedia as well. Okay, what will we learn about tonight? We will learn about some of the history of the Mayflower ship that the passengers set sail on. We will learn about some of the passengers, why they left England in the first place, the voyage itself, the landing, and how to search your Mayflower genealogy. First, we're gonna talk about the history of the Mayflower ship. Okay, back at the time of the Mayflower, there were 26 vessels bearing the name Mayflower during the reign of King James I. So when you're researching the Mayflower ship that we are talking about, you need to look around the 1626, the, between 1610 and 1619, and then of course 1620, if you're looking for the right Mayflower ship, because Mayflower just happened to be a very popular name at that time. And Captain Christopher Jones was part owner of the Mayflower, and I will talk about him in the next slide. Okay, Christopher Jones was also the captain of the Mayflower, so he set sail with his crew and with the passengers coming to the New World. The Mayflower ship itself, if you look at pictures, it looks like a very large ship, but it was not a very large ship for that time period. It was actually very small. It was a square rigged with a beakhead bow with high castle like structures on the lower and the aft of the ship. Her stern was 50 feet high. The exact dimensions are unknown. There have been a lot of research to try to get the exact dimensions, but they have not been able to find the exact dimensions. They've looked in Captain Jones records. They've looked in William Bradford's um, books and his memoirs and his notes and whatever. They also looked in William Brewster's stuff and there's just nothing on the exact dimensions. So anything that they give you is an estimate on what they think. The Mayflower ship was also very heavily armed and her largest gun was a minion cannon with brass weighing at 1,200 pounds. So a very, very heavy and large gun. The Mayflower ship was also an English ship because it was chartered under the English flag but it was, also, it was also a Dutch cargo flute. Mayflower was originally created for cargo. It was not created for passenger passengers. It was created for cargo. And they believe it weighed 180 tons plus, and that comes from the writings of William Bradford. Also, it had 80 to 90 feet decks 100 to 110 feet overall. Again, that came out of the writings of William Bradford. The ship had four decks, carried around 135 people, including 30 crew. Mayflower was never created for long distance ship, a long distance ship. It was meant, it was meant to go from England to the Netherlands and back. That was the whole purpose of the ship. It was never made for long distance. It was also never made for ocean voyages either going over the Atlantic. That was not the purpose of why the ship was created. Okay, the Mayflower also had three afts, it, masts. It had one at the aft, the main and the floor, plus the bow. It had three main levels, it had the main level, then it had the gun level, which had the gun on it, and then it had the cargo, the cargo hold. On the main deck, you had the captain's quarters, which were on the stern of the ship. Then the steerage room was forward at the front of the ship. The poop deck was the highest level above the steen and the, ca the captain of the sailors were on that level. 
the gun dock was where the passengers reside. Would you believe that? On a gun dock is where all the passengers sat. And then the cargo hold, which was the bottom of the ship, is where all the passengers kept their belongings. Okay, passengers and crew. There were 102 passengers on the Mayflower. It, there was approximately 25 to 30 crew, okay? A lot of the writings say it was 25, but there are some that I'm finding saying 30. So the crew approximation is between 25 and 30. They're not exactly sure of the, the correct amount of crew because the crew would start on the ship and then leave the ship. And so they're not exactly sure on, the, they know the passengers are correct, but the crew is a question by about five people. Okay. Then we're gonna go over some of the, pa we're just, I'm just gonna list the passengers. We're talking about William Bradford, um, John Carver, um, John Alden, Priscilla Mullins, Stephen Hopkins, William Brewster, Miles Standish, John Holland, Thomas Rogers, John and Eleanor Billington, Francis Cook, Edward Fuller, Edward Tilly, Edward Dottie, and DeGore Priest. And, th and those are just some of the popular names that I wanted to go over. And now we're gonna go over a couple of the real popular ones. The first one is William Bradford. And most people are gonna remember Bradford for three main things. First, he was the second governor of the colony when they came over here. He was also, the only passenger that had the most children. So he has the most descendants of any of the passengers on the Mayflower because most of his children lived to adulthood and were able to have children and their children had children. And most of the, the family sizes had a lot of children. So that's why he's got more children. And then he was also the leading figure in the Puritan movement. So that's why he is well known then a lot of people will recognize the name John Alden. John Alden, believe it or not, was a crew member. He was not an actual passenger. He was actually one of the crew. He was a ship's cooper. And if people want to know what a cooper is, a cooper is a person that makes wooden caskets, barrels, vessels, that type of thing. Um, for, for people. So that's what a Cooper does. He was married to Priscilla Mullins. He remained in the new world when the Mayflower headed back to England. Now the Mayflower did not stay here. It actually went once all the passengers were off and everything was settled. He went, they, the Mayflower sailed back to England, but John Alden actually stayed behind. And he was also the last surviving signer of the Mayflower Compact. And I will talk about the Mayflower Compact in a little bit. But he was the last surviving signer of that document. Okay, John Carver. John Carver was one of the leaders of the Puritan movement. He inspired the pilgrims to greatness. He was also considered by author John Meacham as the Moses of the pilgrims. So when people had questions or anything, they went to John Carver for advice. He was also credited for writing the Mayflower Compact and was the first signer of the actual document. And he was also the first governor of the Plymouth Colony. And he was also married twice. So he married two different women. Okay, Priscilla Mullins. She was 18 years old when she left on the Mayflower. She married John Alden and they had 10 children. Miles Standish. He was a commander of the Plymouth Colony Militia. He learned the language of the Indians and was married to Rose. Now Miles Standish paid a big part for the pilgrims because he was able to communicate with the Indians 
and they were able to build homes, they were able to plant, because he was able to speak the, the language of the Indians and was able to learn how to plant in the ground, which they didn't know what type of type of soil it was. And they learned how to build the right homes and stuff like that to survive the cold temperatures. Stephen Hopkins was the assistant to the governor of the Plymouth Colony through 1636. He was a tanner and a merchant. He, the first formal meeting with the natives was held in his home. John Holland was an indentured servant. So he, so he helped, uh, he was a servant to one of the passengers on the Mayflower. And he was also executive assistant and secretary governor for John Carver. Thomas Rogers, I just want to mention at least one person that was just a passenger on the, on the ship. Um, so he really, <coughs> excuse me, really didn't do very much, but he was a passenger. So I just wanted to mention a passenger. And then William Brewster was a leader also in the Puritan movement. And he was also considered an elder in the, in the Puritan movement. Then there's Isaac Allerton, who was assistant to the governor, Governor John Carver, and he was involved in the colony finances. And then there's Edward Winslow, who was the third governor of the colony. He was a commissioner of the military group, and he was the only one on the Mayflower that had experience as a diplomat. So he had worked with governments and stuff like that. And he was able to talk with the King of England and talk to anybody else in England and be able to talk very well with the current governor and the governor that followed him because he knew how to, he knew how to talk to people. Okay, why did they leave England? Okay, the Purins back at that time did not like how the Church of England ran things. Okay, they were not happy. So they tried church reform in England. It didn't work. So they left because they wanted to separate from the Church of England and Church of England would not let them, so they left. They also thought of themselves as saints and they called themselves saints. So anytime you're reading anything on the Mayflower Pilgrims or the Puritan movement or the Puritan time period, and you see the word saints, that's what they considered themselves. So any writing will have the word saints all over the documentation because that's what they thought, thought of themselves and that's what they wanted to be called. So then they left for Holland. Why did, why did they, why they left Holland? Life in Holland was very hard, okay? There was scattering, danger everywhere, okay? They were concerned about their children being corrupted in the environment. They hoped while they were in Holland, they could advance the gospel. But what they didn't realize is that King James I had developed a alliance with the Holland, so the Church of England stretched to Holland. So the Church of England um, was over in Holland as well. Okay, the voyage itself. The Mayflower set sail from England in July of 1620. They proceeded down the Thames to the south coast of England. They anchored in Southampton awaiting the Speedwell from Holland. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that not, not all of the pilgrims left England to go to Holland. Just a handful of, not a handful, quite a few, few of them left to go to Holland to start, but there were some that still, still stayed in England until they knew everything was okay in Holland. So they, they anchored in Southampton awaiting the Speedwell. The Speedwell was bringing the Puritans from, carrying the Puritans who left England for Holland and bring them back. 
Well, Mayflower and the Speedwell departed at the end of July. The Speedwell developed a leak and both ships were forced to return to Southampton. They set sail again on August 5th. Again, the Speedwell developed a leak and forced the ships to return this time to Dartmouth for repairs. They set sail once again and the Speedwell developed a leak. It was now September. This time they returned to Plymouth, England. The decision was to abandon the Speedwell and all the passengers and all their belongings were loaded on an already crowded Mayflower. They waited seven days for the winds to pick up. In September, the Atlantic Ocean was known for harsh western gales, which made travel dangerous over the ocean. Provisions were already quite low when they left Southampton the first time and kept lowering because of the delays. The passenger, passengers on board were already there the entire time. When they set sail and came back, they were not allowed to get off the ship. So even with all those delays, they had to stay on the ship. They could not leave the ship for any reason. And the passengers were very worn out. Halfway, half, the first half of the voyage was, was over very calm seas. Then the weather changed and storms were hurling. Huge waves were crashing on the top deck. During one of the storms, physician Samuel Fuller's servant died because he fell overboard. Um, John Holland was actually washed overboard and was rescued by the crew. While traveling across the ocean, one of the women, Elizabeth Hopkins, the wife of Stephen Hopkins, gave birth on the Mayflower to a son that she named Oceanus after the ocean. Okay, while in the middle of the ocean, the ship became close to being disabled completely, and they may have had to return to England. The storm damaged the ship's main beam so badly, and the main beam made it with, that's the one that had the big sail. If they were not able to fix that, then they were stuck. But luckily, one of the passengers had a metal jack screw that fixed the problem, and then they were able to proceed West. While they were on the voyage, they suffered very harsh conditions. Spaces were dark. There was very little sunlight coming through the ship, so it was very dark. And they also very cramped spaces. Now, remember at the beginning of the presentation, I told you the Mayflower was a very small, it was a small ship. The Speedwell was a lot larger in size than the Mayflower was. So when they brought everybody from the Speedwell onto the Mayflower, it took up more space. And the food was cold. I mean, the Mayflower was a wooden ship. They couldn't start fires because the wood would catch fire. So food was very cold. Also remember back at that time, there was no indoor bathrooms. So there were no bathrooms on the ship. So people would have to go into the corner of the ship to use the bathroom. There was also very tight quarters. So people were literally touching each other in their spaces. So there was no privacy. It was very uncomfortable. We're talking the fall here. So it was very cold. A lot of people suffered seasickness. And like I said, no bathrooms. People would go in the corner to use the bathroom. So it was unsanitary conditions on the ship itself. Okay, the first, I wouldn't say official landing, but the first um, time that they docked, okay, was on the 9th of November, 1620. The pilgrims would see what is present day Cape Cod. And then they spent several days to sail south. 
Originally, their destination was the colony of Virginia. That's where they got permission to dock, okay? And they obtained permission to settle from the company of merchant adventures. Strong winds prevented them from sailing south, so they ended up having to go back up a little north and, you know, land where, where they found a spot to land. So before they anchored, the Mayflower Compact was signed by all men on the ship. The Mayflower Compact was an agreement to set up a self-governing community. So before any of the passengers could get off the ship, they all had to agree that they would all govern the community or colony evenly. Nobody would take control over anybody else, like the King of England, you know, that type of thing. Everything would be on, on even even level. And also, if you also notice, it was all men that signed the compact. None of the women aboard the ship were allowed to sign it. It was just the men. So they actually anchored on the 11th of November, 1620. Their first winter in the new world, they faced many difficulties during their first winters. The risk of starvation the lack of suitable winter shelter. Now remember, originally when they were gonna leave, they were gonna leave in July. So they're wearing all spring-like what, you know, spring-like clothing. You know, they didn't have the things you would think that they'd have for winter. And because, and they figured that they'd have time to build shelter before they arrived. Well, it didn't happen. So there was no winter shelter for them. They also had the lack of the knowledge of the ground, meaning the soil. They didn't know what the soil was going to be like. Again, like I said, they didn't have proper clothing because they, they were originally going to get there in the summertime. Passengers remained on the Mayflower, on board the Mayflower. So again, they were not allowed to leave the ship. So there was an outbreak of contagious disease on the ship itself. So half of the passengers died and the crew. So they lost quite a few crew members and half of the passengers had died before they even left the ship itself. Okay, in December, 1620, the Pilgrim Fathers left the ship to, to look around. There was snow everywhere, okay? They started to construct habitation one by one they died. And the first governor, Sir John Carver, and his wife died in April 1621. Okay, now we're going to get into Mayflower genealogy. This Mayflower genealogy happens, to, has always been a very um, interesting topic for a lot of people if they had Mayflower ancestry. Now, Mayflower ancestry, like some of the other things, not everybody has this, but it's always nice to do the looking and see if you actually have one. I am still looking for my own Mayflower ancestor. I'm helping other people get in, but I'm still working on myself. So, okay. To start your research, you need to see if you already know you have a Mayflower ancestor. So if you already know you're related to William, Bradford, William Brewster, John Alden, you have it made, okay? Or do you have family in the area of Plymouth during the Mayflower period? If you did, then there's a little more work involved, but then chances are you may find something, you may not, but again, it's a journey. Okay, so if you already have a Mayflower ancestor, then you wanna check out the books on the Mayflower passengers. And those are the silver books. This is one of the silver books. Each, pa each passenger on the Mayflower has one of these. Not all of them will be of this width or this size. It depends on the number of descendants that they have. Um, and then there's two additions. There's um, the first three editions, which were the ones that were done earlier, and then 
the first five generations, which is the one I'm that I'm holding in my hand right now. Now I know Arlington Heights Memorial Library owns copies of these in their library in their library collection, but they're in library use only. So you'd have to actually go in and look at the books at the library, or if you know which. Um, child of the Mayflower passenger you're looking for, you may find a reference librarian who would be willing to print some of the pages for you. If you don't know if you do have an ancestor, then you would do basic genealogy. You would start with yourself and go back generations until you get to the generation, two generations before the Mayflower period and see if you have somebody that could connect you to a passenger. Okay, and then here's another picture of the book that I just showed you. A lot of people actually would rather see me hold it than have it on the screen, but you got to see it both ways. <laughs> okay, the Mayflower websites. There are many Mayflower websites out there. One of the popular ones is the mayflowerhistory.com. Now this will give you the history of the pilgrims. It'll give you history of the voyage. It will give you help with, give you a list of the passengers. It will give you Mayflower genealogy assistance. So I'm gonna click on the Mayflower genealogy on the website. And then it takes you to this page. There's four sections. There's the earlier passenger lists for the Plymouth Colony. Now, everybody remembers the Mayflower, but the Mayflower was not the only ship coming to the New World. You had the Fortune in 1621, and then in 1623, there was the Anne and the Little James that came after. So there were four ships total coming to the New World but the Mayflower was the first one to dock. Then there's online genealogical resources. There's the Leiden Archives, which is the Netherlands, Holland. Then the National Archives in London. Then there's a probate search for Canterbury, which is also in England. Then there's the Merrill Documents Register search. Then there's the New England Historic and Genealogical Society, which I will talk about in a few minutes. And then there's the Massachusetts Historical Society too, that you wanna check. And then there's the Massachusetts Archives, the Massachusetts Vital Records Online and Connecticut Vital Records Online. Then there's the famous Mayflower Descendants. And if you click on there, you can see that a lot of a lot of movie stars, a lot of TV stars, a lot of presidents, a lot of church members ha I have some type of connection to a Mayflower passenger. And that is just very interesting to take a look at. What a lot of people also don't know is with genealogy, if you are related to a Mayflower crew member, that works too to join because there's a Mayflower Society, which I will talk about also in a few minutes, that if, you are, if you're a descendant of a Mayflower passenger or a crew member, you can join the society. A lot of people think it's just the passengers. No, if you connect to a crew member of the Mayflower, you can still get in. And then there's also the Merchant Adventures, Ventures, who had shareholders in the Plymouth Colony. And then again, these are the silver books that I had just shown you a few minutes ago. Okay, this is Leiden's website. So this is the Netherlands website and they have their own pilgrim archives that you can look to see if any of your family members were in Holland that they had, <coughs> They had left England and came to Holland and they left some records there. And so you can go into the pilgrim records here. There is, I don't have it currently on the screen, but there is a translator on here 
So you can translate the information from Dutch to English so you can so you can actually read what what it's telling you. There's also translators that free translators online. So if it's not able to translate, you can go to Google Translate or several other translators that are free online and get the stuff translated that way as well. But this is one of the sites you can go to for Pilgrim Records. Then there's the Mayflower organizations. And the big one is the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. This is a lineage society, a hereditary society, which means you have to have a blood related connection to a Mayflower passenger. So it would have to be a great, 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 great grandfather or a great, great, great grandmother. You cannot get in any other way. It has to be a blood relation going all the way back. Okay. But this website does offer additional information, information about the society, information about some of the passengers. They do have a shop that you can go buy stuff in if you want. You do not have to be a member to make a donation if you would like to make a donation. This, if you click on 2020, you can see what they did for the anniversary. They have and they still have this going on, saving the meeting house initiative to try to preserve their meeting house in Plymouth. So you can make donations to that if you want. And then under publications, they have the Mayflower Quarterly, which is a magazine that they put out every other month. And then there's the Mayflower Descendant which is one devoted just to Mayflower passengers. And both of those you can subscribe as a non-member, but you will have to pay the non-member fee, which is a little higher than the member's fee. But you can also do that as well if you're interested. Okay, now a lot of the passengers have their own sites as well or their own organizations. So this one, for example, is Alden's House Historic Site. This is for John Alden and Priscilla Mullins. They give you a virtual tour of the homestead. You would just click on virtual and see a wonderful virtual tour of the facility. You can, there's a shop where you can buy stuff if you would like, information on how to visit, and then membership, if you are de a descendant of John Alden or Priscilla Mullins, you qualify for membership in this group. Now, if you have joined the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, all you'd have to do is provide that application to this organization and you're in. Now, going back to the General Society and this one as well, it is open to men and women. These groups are not men only, women only, men or women and children can join these organizations. They just ask that one of the adults do it first because then the children, all the children have to do is provide a birth certificate and they're in. Um, the adults would have to prove more information going back to join. And then there was a anniversary in Duxbury 2020 for the Mayflower as well. Okay, and then there's the Pilgrim Hopkins Heritage Society. All of the passenger societies are named differently. This one is listed as a heritage society. And then this one, I like the way it's set up. You have a main menu here that gives you a little more information. You have the latest news for the organization, information on how to join, the history of the organization, the activities of the society, newsletters, and bingo lineage. So you can click here on lineage and get some help with doing your lineage for Stephen Hopkins. Now, a word to the wise regarding Stephen Hopkins. 
there is another Stephen Hopkins out there. So when you're doing your research, you want to make sure that you have the Stephen Hopkins that was actually on the Mayflower and not the other Stephen Hopkins who I am related to that, that was not on the Mayflower at all. So, and then a nice feature that they have is if you click here, you can get the latest happenings going on in this society. Okay, and then there's Elder William Brewster Society. And then they have um, Plymouth 1644 and Scrooby 1566. Now this one is in England. This one is here in the US. I like this site as well because they have the little headings up here, the lineage form. So you need a form to join this society. It's right on the front page. You don't have to, you don't have to search for it. All of these societies also have insignias. They have pins. If anybody on here is familiar with the DAR and how the DAR likes their bling, meaning jewelry, the, these societies are no different. And they give you the option right here to how to purchase the insignia. Then they have a click he, a link here for their newsletters and then articles and links and how to contact them if you'd like to contact them. The other reason why I like this site is the eligibility to join is right on the front page. So you don't have to click on eligibility to find it. It's right on the front page telling you how to join, what the fees are, if there is an application fee to join, that type of thing. It's all right on the front page to help you with your searching and joining. Okay, then these are some other websites that you can take a look at. I mentioned the Mayflower History. Here's the Mayflower Society again. History.com has a section on the Mayflower and this um, website will take you directly in there. The AmericanAncestors.org is the New England Historic and Genealogical Society in downtown Boston. They have, in conjunction with the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, have created their own page off of the American Ancestors website, which has a research database on, on Mayflower genealogy. So there's databases for you to search. There's forms to fill out. If you're not sure whether, you know, the research you've done is going to fly, there's a form to fill out. Of course, there's a fee, but you can have them look at your work before you send it to the general society to see if it's going to fly with the organization. And then there's familyhistorydaily.com, which also has a section on how to do Mayflower research. And this link that's also in your handout will take you directly to that page. Then there were also a couple that they had going on during the anniversary. These three are still open. The Mayflower 400, which is the UK, UK's website. Then there's the mayflowereventnews.com, Leiden, that one is still up. And, and then the Plymouth 400 Incorporated, that site is still up for people to look at. Then I always mention Ancestry, Family Search, and then I don't highly recommend wikis or Wikipedia, but the familypedia on wiki.org is a very good website to look up your Mayflower Ancestry. Again, when you're looking at wikis and you're looking at Wikipedia, you just have to take it with the grain of caution because you don't know who posted it up there, but there is some good legit information on the Familypedia site. So I would highly recommend you take a look at that site if you're interested in Mayflower research. Okay, and then this is the American Ancestors website for the New England group. So I just wanted to show you what the one of the front pages look looks like. And then then if you go to if you click on search here, there will be a Mayflower link 
which will take you to this page that I talked about a few a minute or two ago. There's a section on the passengers, a section on the nature, nations and cultures. You have to remember when the Mayflower came over, it wasn't just the US that was involved. It was England, it was the Netherlands, and there was another country which my, my mind just went blank on um, that was involved in putting passengers on the Mayflower to come to the new world. So this gives you that information on the nations and the cultures involved. Then this is where I talked about you confirming your ancestry. If you've already done your searching and you think you qualify, you can click on the click on confirm your ancestry. There is a form to fill out. You send it with an amount of money and then they will search and see if you qualify. If they say you qualify, then you go back and you fill out the full application for the general society and then provide the proof that you're related and then, and then you can get in. Then there's search their databases here regarding Mayflower. And then there's also a shop here with specific Mayflower um, books, Mayflower cups, Mayflower bookmarks, you know, stuff, you know, Mayflower related are all on there. Okay, and then this is how you would go in to search their databases. You would type in the first and last name of the Mayflower ancestor. I always tell people don't put the years first, just do a search first and see what you come up with. Okay. If you do not want to do that, then you can go browse their database, click on the volume that you want to look at. And if you know and you know the page numbers, you can click browse and you can search the database that way. I recommend just going in here and typing the person's name. It saves you saves you a lot of time with with researching. But this is where you would go to actually do the researching. Okay, and then this is the passenger section that I had talked about, which is right here. It gives you a list of all of the passengers and then some brief information on each of the passengers and then the first generation of children of the Mayflower ancestor. So you got John Alden here and Priscilla Mullins, and these are the names of their children. So you can see how many children he had and that how many boys, how many girls, and then when he died and that type of thing is all right here. And all and every passenger is done like this um, with a you know, just some basic information and then their first generation of their children. Okay, now family search. Okay, both family search and ancestry do have some information on the Mayflower. Family search has more than ancestry does because family search does have access to the silver books. Ancestry does not, but family search does. So you, so I recommend you go to the, go to keyword search. Then I would type in Mayflower. Now there's availability of searching any, online or just family history center. I recommend people do any first and see what comes up. If there's too many, then you can narrow it down. But this way you can look at all of them and see what they've got. So then I hit Mayflower, I do that. I hit the search box. Now I got 3,289 results. And the first page is always gonna have uh, all the pages are going to have 20 results on each of the pages. Now we're only looking at the first six on the list. So you have the it now you will find if you're doing research or you're interested in joining the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, there are two sets of books. Now I mentioned about the silver books. The silver books are the full blown 
research that hit the the research and the applications coming in that have been proven that put these silver books together. Okay. They do not do these silver books all the time. Okay. The one I have that I showed you copyright, let's see, is 2004. So it's beyond the 10 year marker for this volume. What they do is they will put a silver book out then when they have enough, they will do like an addendum, like it says here, an addendum, which will be either a pink or a green volume of the most recent research and ancestors that have been proven through the general society, okay? The green ones typically tend to be smaller. The pink become are a little bit bigger, and then you have Mr. Jumbo. You have the big printed ones. They're not going to print these big silver books until they have enough to put in a volume of this size. So that's why they put the addendums out. That way you can still see some information until they're ready to produce a big uh, silver book itself. So this is the green or the pink, like I told you. Then there's Edward Dotty. So Edward Dotty has a book like this, but the book here is um, Descendants for Four Generations. The one I showed you is five, but this one's four, but it's still helpful. Then you have the Mayflower Family's First Generation, Descendants of Pilgrims. Now, the ones that you have like this in the addendum right here, it just means that when they cataloged this, they cataloged just the general heading and then they have each volume listed under the main heading instead of cataloging each one individually they just put a general heading and then put the volumes in um, in the record itself then you will also find on here you will find membership registries and rosters for some of the state societies most of the states in the united states have a national society of Mayflower descendants. Okay, there's the national society, and then there's the state. Then there's the state societies. Okay, so I went ahead and clicked on Mayflower families through the five generations. You will get the title, the authors that were involved, what the format is, and what the language is. And then these are the volumes or the copies. Okay, so you would need to know volume one, let's say, is William Bradford, you know, and the second one is Brewster. So you would need to know the volume numbers to be able to look at these. Okay, but you can do that. Um, by just going on to make General Society Mayflower Descendants, they have a list of all the silver books that have been published. So you can find out. Because the first four generations, they were all pretty much put in volume. Um, when Then when they did generation five, they've been sporadic. When they have enough to send something to the printer, then they will do that. There's one ancestor of a passenger that they ended up doing it in two volumes instead of one because they had so much that they didn't want the book to be not able to handle. So they ended up putting it into two volumes and both volumes came out at the same time. So it just depends on the number of descendants that particular passenger had and how much has been proven for them to be able to put together a volume. Okay, then this is Edward Dotty. I mean, Edward Fuller, pardon me. Edward Fuller's Mayflower and his descendants, again, for four generations. This one has been digitized. So this one is available online. So when you see view a digital version, you can go ahead and click on here. And then it will take you to this page. And then this is... The, for, for the cover of the book that was that was scanned okay and then down below 
you can click view all pages. So this one is only 44 pages. So this is a new one when they did this, was, which was back a while ago. And you can click on all 44 pages and you can actually download it and put it on your computer if you wanted to. Now, I just wanted to show you what some of the pages look like and how these books are set up to help you with your research. Now, they will always start with the first generation, which is the Pilgrim. So this one is Edward Fuller, and it gives you the information that the National Society has on the Pilgrim ancestor. Now, if you look right after the first name, they have uh, number one after it, because that tells you that, that is the Pilgrim generation, which is gener first generation, okay? And then it gives you the wife's information and then the children and then the references of where the information came from. Now, I don't know whether I have any people on here that have done lineage society, joined lineage societies before, but any lineage society, you need to provide proof, meaning birth, marriage, and death information, linking the one person to your ancestor, okay? And these re resources here link him to his wife and to his two children, okay? So they're, so we're gonna start with, so Matthew has a number two after it. So then generation two, you have Math, Matthew Fuller, and I think I've got him over here. Now, each generation, you will have more and more information that has been discovered about the, about the descendants. So this is Matthew Fuller. He's got a two, and then Edward is next to him with the one, giving you brief information, but, you know, you know, birth, marriage, and death information. And then it gives you a history of the, the descendant if they have information on the descendant. Then if you scroll down, it will also give you where he's from, will information, that type of thing. And then the children. And then also the references and also notes if, you, if notes are required in this book. We're gonna go generation three will be Samuel. Um, Samuel, so you go to generation three and then you've got Samuel. And you would keep going back and back and back until, you know, the society has stopped with the last known generation that they are familiar with. So you got Samuel here, Matthew, Edward, and then Thomas would be the next one. And then you go back. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to show you a couple of the front pages of a couple of the websites I had talked about. This is the commemoration for the UK regarding the Mayflower. This is still up. You can still look at it, see what they did to commemorate the events. This is the Mayflower Project. Um, and what the project does is it lists all the links to all of the countries that had something going on regarding the commemoration. So this site is still up that you can take a look at. Then this is the Plymouth 400, and you're actually looking at the American page on this where you can get information on the Mayflower and on the passengers through this site. And then I don't want people to forget about the historical, the historical societies regarding, I mentioned the descendants, I mentioned the lineage society, but you don't wanna forget the historical societies. The Historical Society in Plymouth and then the Massachusetts Historical Society are ready, willing, and able to help you with the research if you are looking for a Mayflower ancestor. They are there to help you. They have a lot of the material right on site. If you are not able to go to Plymouth or Massachusetts, you can email them, you can write to them asking for some assistance. There may or may not be a fee, depending on what you are asking for and how much it is. If they offer not to charge you anything, 
as a courtesy, being a genealogist, it is nice to give them something for their efforts because it makes it easier for the genealogist down the road to get information from them if people are making nice donations um, to those organizations. You also don't want to forget some of the historical societies here in Illinois. Even some of the libraries in Illinois do have some Mayflower books that they have purchased over the years that may help you do your research as well. So you don't want to forget any of the local areas. Then you want to also check out the National Geographic Society, Geographic. They have sections and stuff on the Mayflower as well. So does the Historic History Channel. They have a section on their website totally devoted to Mayflower. And then I've already talked about the Massachusetts Historical Society. Okay, and I will stop it there for any questions we have. I don't have anything in the chat. The one thing I did want to also mention briefly is regarding joining the, the National Society. If you do have an ancestor and you do get the application, when you fill out the application, you will need to provide proof of every birth, marriage, and death going all the way back. The first three generations, they're going to need the primary sources, the birth, marriage, and death. After that, they will take the different, different um, documents. They'll take probate records. They'll take wills. They will take land records. They will take church records. But typically, most lineage societies, the first three generations, meaning you, your parents, and your grandparents, you will need to provide all three generations, unless your parents were born in the 1800s and there won't be any, any primary sources, then there would be exceptions made to that. But most of the time they will require, you know, birth, marriage and death for the first three. Does anyone have any questions for Jenny? Well, if not, I, I do want to thank you, Jenny. There was so much great information there. Uh, <laughs> I know I know that it's kind of daunting to, to, to get into all this research, but I think you have kind of cleared the way and answered some questions for us to at least help us to get started. Yes. And yeah. um, thank you for all the background on the Mayflower. I, I, I didn't know much of that, and um, I didn't even know that that the other ship, the Speedwell, yes. how many times did it turn around? Three times. It was like three times. It was like three times it sprung a leak. You okay. know? And like I said, the Speedwell was the bigger of the two ships. Both ships are supposed to leave for the New World. The Speedwell was full, but they couldn't go, so they rammed everybody into the Mayflower, and that's why it was so cramped. Wow. See. I, I, that's why I love these programs. I always learn new things. Um, there's so much I don't know, and I find that out when we have our programs. But again, the background on how to get into all this genealogy research was was very informative. <clears throat> Excuse me, and very interesting. So well, if, if anybody can, has any questions, my email is on the handout, so you can always email me later if something pops that you thought, oh, I should have asked or I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, we always think of them later, unfortunately. Yes, so, yes, yes we do. Get in touch with you. So thank you so much uh, for all the great information. I really enjoyed it. And I uh, will chat with you later. Okay, and thank you so much for having me. I had, I had fun. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.